हे गाइज वेलकम टू अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ द पेरो टॉक पॉडकास्ट आई नो वी हैवेंट अपलोडेड इन ओवर अ मंथ बट दैट्स मेजरली बिकॉज वी हैवेंट फाउंड समथिंग टू एक्साइटिंग टू टॉक अबाउट नॉर हैज द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया क्रिएटेड अ रकस विद एनी ऑफ इट्स पॉलिसीज इन द इन द पास्ट वन मंथ सो वी हैड नथिंग टू क्रिटिक येट ह्यो वी आर वन मंथ लेट बट वी स्टिल कमिंग आउट विद अ न्यू एपिसोड एंड दिस वीक वी हैव अ वेरी वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट विद अस Jay, please introduce our guest to the viewers. All right. So before we get to the guest, I think what we need to talk about is the fact that the new education policy has been introduced, right? And it's often very easy for any common person's eye to miss the intricate details that any such draft or policy that the government introduces has. Since Manan and I are obviously not experts about, uh, well, anything. we decided that it will be better for all of us to have a guest on who actually has experience working in the education sector and understands the minor details as well as the major implications of the nep so today we have with us tanushree sarkar who studied psychology at lsr and then went on to work with stir education as the research insights and learning manager stir is actually an ngo that supports education systems to ignite and to motivate intrinsic learning of teachers officials and students primarily through teacher networks that are operating across a network of countries the vision of star has always been to you know get teachers who love teaching and children who love learning tanushree currently is also working as the research and teaching as a research and teaching assistant at the vanderbilt peabody college and i just want to thank tanushree for taking the time out to join us today uh so tanushree could you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and the work that you've done till now sure hi thanks uh, manan and jay for having me it's really great to talk about the new the new education policy um uh, i like doing productive rants and i hope this is one of several productive rants i get to do in life um so <laughs> thanks for the great introduction by the way uh so my name is tanushree i did my undergrad in psychology and then i went to the london school of economics and did my masters degree um in social and cultural psychology worked in the education sector for a couple of years and then started doing my phd in uh, in community research and action my area of work is primarily inclusive education in india and i'm very interested in sort of the relationship between um education policy and teacher practices in the classroom so really trying to um uh, connect macro level things to micro level things that happen in the classroom so yeah i think that's a lot of education also like just to <laughs> just to hear lsr and lse and all that education i think I'm I'm at that point in my life where I feel like I'm going to drop out at any moment <laughs> but li- listening to what you've done I have I have a lot and a lot of respect for you All right so I think we should just jump right into it So the first thing that came to at least my mind and even Manoj's mind when we were discussing all of this was that there are a lot of individual aspects that everyone has gotten to know about you know say the the mother tongue and the vocational courses being introduced but i think uh, what was missing was just you know a brief overview of what the nep actually is so tanushree could you explain to us what the new education policy is and whether or not it's something that actually should be celebrated by the public or is it just something that's been packaged in a way where it seems like something you know that's very that's going to benefit all of us in the coming years yeah uh my responses to things usually are fairly historical but um uh, in terms of a national education policy this has been uh on a broader level when we think about policy it's sort of like a vision or a framework uh, for the education system in the country right and uh education policies in general tend to be quite broad so you you we talk about the purpose of education and the goals of education um and sort of the ways to achieve those goals is is sort of what broadly what policy tries to do um uh, but uh this is one of the things that i've been seeing in, in the media about the nep in particular is this like after 34 years we've had a new education policy and that's something great and new um uh, 
So the first education policy we ever had was in 1968. And that's good context to have. I think Indira Gandhi was prime minister back then. And then the next one happened in 1986, which was when Rajiv Gandhi was prime minister. Uh, there were a few edits in the 1990s, and then we've reached to 2020, uh, which is our new education policy. But I think it's it's helpful to know that it's not like nothing was happening in education in the last 34 years. Uh, we've had a lot of big changes in education, starting from the National Curriculum Framework, the Right to Education Act. There's been some really big shifts in how uh, education policy has been thought about. Um, and in some ways, the NEP is sort of like a culmination of a particular of a movement in a particular direction of education policy. And I don't want to uh, sort of point to what that movement is just right now. I like the suspense of it, but I also think I don't want to I don't want to sort of give your viewers the answer. Right? What I'm hoping for us to do today is to help your well, your not your viewers, your listeners, to get some sense of like what are the kinds of questions you should be asking when you're reading this policy. Um, now, a couple of things I would just want to point out, like some of the ideas are new in this policy, but a lot of them are things that we've already seen for a very long time. Um, and it's sort of like a restatement of that. And I, I'll point to some things that are new. Uh, one is the sort of, uh, great emphasis to the private sector, private schools, private universities within the policy. That's new. The idea of performance-based tables is relatively new. This notion of foundational learning and numeracy and the way that they've thought about it, although that's not a new idea, but the way they've emphasized it is new. Um, and then the whole foreign university stuff. I think they've done a lot more new things in higher ed. But uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of what else I want to add. So I think the first question that comes to my mind when I actually read the policy was... We, we've always heard that, okay, he's completed his 10 plus 2. That means he's done his 12th. Now, suddenly they come up with 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. Mm -hmm. What does that exactly mean? So, well, if we just add that up, that's 15 years of education now instead of 12, right? So that's... Right. And so what that means is that there's going to be a lot more focus on early childhood. And what the policy says is that, you know, 85% of the child's brain development happens before the age of 6 or something like that. Um, and so they're trying to now have uh, education happen between the ages of three to eight. And that's really expanding the ambit of universalizing education that's usually been within the ages of six to 14. Um, and now we're expanding and saying, well, hey, we're going to do three to 18. And within those sort of five plus three plus three plus four, we're going to have different uh, sort of focus areas in that. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into a lot more detail of just exactly what those focus areas are. No, I think uh, I think we've all relatively read about what the focus areas are. Mm -hmm. But what confuses me a little bit is how there's actually like, so a lot of the things that we learn, like coding, mm -hmm. like coding at our age, like we were supposed to learn coding starting, let's say 11th. Mm -hmm. But now that they're saying that coding is supposed to start in class six, yeah. is is the, isn't there like a learning gap between what a grade six student can actually actually learn as compared to what a grade eleven student can learn? Do you think do you think there's some sort of um, inequity with respect to that? I mean, I think the the idea of teaching young kids coding is not new. It's it's been there in other countries uh, for like very very young kids to start coding. Uh, the way you think about coding is a little bit different for younger kids, right? You might just think about principles of linear programming more than anything else uh, for younger kids. I'm, I'm okay. curious how they want to implement right. it because I think I just checked the figures and they're like 15% of schools in India have functioning computers. So I'll be curious to see how this works out in implementation. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Because I think that creates a divide as well between people who can actually afford that level of technology and and computers versus people who cannot right and i think with implications to that as well i think byju's has acquired white hat junior uh, a startup which actually promotes coding for stu for like young students mm -hmm. right so i think they're already prepping for that uh, another question that i have in mind is related to the regional language like like teaching in the regional language sort of again creates a confusion in my head whether 
people from say delhi and people from let's say tamil nadu will be taught in different languages and how is that going to work well so i mean that's already been the case in state boards right so in government schools that run using the state board of education education is in the the language of the state so in tamil nadu it is tamil and in delhi i think it's hindi or uh whatever state states have a lot of leeway in terms of what language that they want to teach it yeah right but isn't that isn't there a difference like le- like let's say when we're um, prepping for our exams mm-hmm. and uh, so in in tamil nadu do they get their question papers in tamil only or is it in english i'm not sure how the cbsc does it but i'm pretty sure that if you're like if you're a, if you're in a state board of education you're getting everything in the language of the state that that's how it's going to work yeah hmm because because i think also that creates a difference between people from say uh underprivileged societies where they feel as if english will be an opportunity for them to grow mm-hmm. but since they haven't been taught in english for a very long time they haven't grasped the language as well as people from let's say the other states have who who have actually who actually have more money and have invested in private schooling so don't you think that creates sort of a divide between the two as well so i mean i think this is a very complicated and and a really something for us for all of us to think about because the question of english um is so i think the way english is taught and like teachers speaking in english uh and students speaking in english is a phenomena that happens in very elite private school spaces right if you go into low fee private school spaces uh there's been a lot of research that point of the school itself is english has claims to be an english medium instruction but the teaching is mostly bilingual um or in fact the teachers often can't speak english themselves or even teach in english right so there are already existing disparities there the policy is sort of alluding to this idea that kids learn better in the language that's spoken at home and there's been a lot of research on that uh but i think it is it gets complicated one because of the colonial legacy of english as a language and the nep talks a lot about sort of preserving indian heritage whatever that means uh but also english being sort of the language of the market so i, I don't think it's going to in some ways it might increase inequities if sort of more parents decide that we want to send our kids to english medium schools because for sure it's not going to get taught in the state schools which is already true but i right. i don't know if that might be right. a greater push in some states hmm. Hmm. and you know that leads me to another doubt that i had while going through the policy you know of what's available in the internet so like we're talking about the fact that a english has become to a certain extent an economic and a political need right and similarly now that they are introducing vocational courses so mm-hmm. the issue that i feel that you know can actually happen is that so the ability of teachers or the quality of teachers who will be taking up these vocational courses in different institutions is also going to vary so the teachers in say government schools who will be teaching these courses that don't have prior precedence in being taught will that will there be a difference in quality and in terms of you know execution and implementation of these courses in government schools and in private schools and i think i think just to follow that up with another question about vocational studies i think um like some of the arguments that i've read on the inter- internet about vocational studies is also that people are saying that there's a sort of like correct me if i'm wrong but there's a choice to it like you can either like take up vocational studies or or you can't so now a lot of the people are saying that in in let's say people who with more privileged backgrounds the parents will not allow their should like their children to take up vocational studies because let's be real india does not have dignity of labor at all and again people who would be taking these vocational co- vocational courses are the ones who would actually be forced into taking these courses right which would actually create a system more like the caste system that already existed in the previous times and is and is still carried forward don't you think that will take precedence again yeah i, I think the the issue of vocational uh of vocational learning is is quite uh, is quite a tenuous one to think about i mean one is just the kind of resources you require to do vocational learning to really well um and then there are questions of equity like you pointed out manan uh and 
I think also implicit in this is a sort of hierarchy of knowledge, right? It's not, it, there is a hierarchy of labor for sure, but there's a hierarchy of knowledge where academic knowledge seems to count a lot more than sort of working with your hands. And hmm. one way to think about it right. is maybe education is the way to transform that. And so like education changes first, society changes second. Uh, that's, I don't know how likely that is, to be honest. One of the things in the policy is this idea of bagless <laughs> days, right? Where kids are not going to have bags right, in school right. and they're just going to do vocational learning from a local community person who's going to come in and teach them, right? But that also shows the sort of like this idea of like right. vocational learning as not being as serious. So, so you don't require knowledge, you don't require books, you don't require bags, bags okay. right? Like, yeah. So it is undermining yeah, even yeah. In, its, in, its, in the policy itself. But I think the if, if I were to mm. think of this as a most well-intentioned way that a lot of the focus within education policy in India has been the sort of question of relevance. Um, you know, is the policy mm. is education actually relevant to the needs of the people? Uh, but then, of course, the question is also, does education work as a, as a means of social mobility and social and economic mobility? Right? And that's that tension is always there. And we right. really see that tension play out in, right. in the idea of vocational education in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so while we are talking about how this is going to, this might be a step towards, you know, having an equal society. And in my opinion, this is going to be a fruitful move because I do think that once a parents see that their kids also have the skills that they used to look down upon or were just not, you know, deemed fit enough to take up as a profession, if they are being taught these skills in school, then I do feel that, you know, that's going to bring about a change in the mindset as well. But one more thing that, you know, obviously, since everything in our country that's happening right now has political motives attached to it, right? So I was going through a few articles online and I read this one Kothari Commission report, which I think was started in 1964, 1966, which talks about education as a means of, you know, combining traditional values and constitutional values. So in a time where the government and the party in power is doing everything that they can to, you know, do away with constitutional values, how do you think that this draft or the NEP being implemented has to do with the political atmosphere and the political culture that we are in right now? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to answer that in a second. I do want to go back to what you said about vocational education just for a sec because I think uh you talked about parents seeing value. I do think that uh it also like it's not just about parents seeing value, it's about how society assigns value to work like that. Right? Are we going to pay vocations more? Is it another question, right? Like why would someone want to go into a vocation if they're not going to pay? Exactly. I was going to talk about how capitalism will take precedence any day. And again, if they aren't paid well, they, they won't be taken up by many students. Right, and we've been talking about India right. as a knowledge economy, as in the IT economy. That's not, like, I, I'm, I'm struggling to see how that's compatible with... Uh, Vocations that may or may not be taught. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, but uh, coming back to your question of uh, traditional knowledge and constitutional values, um, for me, a lot of answers, especially when it comes to education policy in India come down to colonialism. And I hate to harken back to the history of colonialism, but I think it's very relevant because that's been a big struggle in India, right? It's like, how do we see pride in being Indian when a lot of what colonialism was about was and colonial education was about was teaching Indians how to not like being Indian, how to be better. And to be better was to be English. Um, and so I think and, and Western, Western, right? Yeah. And so that struggle has has never gone away. Yeah. Um, and you see that struggle take place in the very extreme of sort of the right wing claiming we are going to decolonize the curriculum by teaching the correct truths about India. Um, and then the other end of it is mm. like, you know, we're just not going to talk about it at all and we're just going to move on and we're going to create a modern India. And that's been a struggle for a very long time. Um, and you can see mm -hmm. really that struggle play out in the way this policy has been written, right? It will talk about 
uh, individual cognitive development and economic growth of the country, but it will also talk about preserving and upholding culture and tradition uh, in, in a very narrowly defined idea of what Indian culture and tradition is. And I think that's where that contention comes about. Uh, in terms of this government destroying constitutional values, I I hope that they're unable to do that. <laughs> uh, and I hope India's constitution is, is a lot more stronger than that. Um, and I hope that the education system, like uh, the ways in which academia is being targeted right now, I think there's, there's a lot to think about. Yeah. Yeah, and the just, you know, like we were talking about constitutional values, the one question that I do have is that whether or not during the, you know, during when they are, when they were figuring out the various aspects of this policy, was there enough correspondence with all necessary stakeholders, say teachers, schools, students, or was this something that was done in a very unilateral and centralized manner, like most of the decisions that are being made? Yeah, also to add up to that, I think there were several articles where I read that the states hmm. were not like informed or even even talked with when they were coming up with the policy. And again, it was sort of like control at the center. And that's how they implemented, like that's how they came up with the policy. Yeah, I, I've been struggling with this one uh, and thinking about this, this question of how this policy came about. So I think the process sort of started right after the first BJP government came into power. So 2014, it was part of their manifesto. Um, and they sort of thought, started consultations and they came out with this draft in 2019, which is about a 400-page draft. Um, mm-hmm. And then they started doing very intense public consultations. So if you look at, I think, the gov.in website, it will tell you exactly how many stakeholders it reached out to. You can even watch a lot of the consultations that were done. So in some ways, they did reach out to a lot of people. Um, and for example, like disability rights activists, and you'll see a lot of disability focus within the policy, but they really advocated for it. There was a whole period of seeking feedback from people about this, right? So you can say that the, the, the hmm. consultation process did try to involve a lot of stakeholders. So you might call it participatory, but I'm not sure it was democratic. Um, and by that, I respect hmm. democratic institutions um, so there was no debate after the draft came out and before the cabinet took it in the parliament right which meant hmm. which means that even though they consulted a whole bunch of people did they consult the actual representatives of the people and that's been a struggle with me with this government when it claim to be like take feedback from everyone and be very publicly consultative but then sidestep democratic institutions that are designed to do that um so yeah yeah i think i think that's a, that's a brilliant way to put it how you said it also i think one last question related to the schooling context would be a the like we said not like making education more traditional so they're saying that they'll include more sanskrit in the curriculum again I'm not too sure whether that's a great move. The second question, like putting all the critique aside, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the policy where they say that you can choose subjects, right? Where you can choose any subject that you want. I think that's a great move because, again, that is something all of us as students were looking for when we were in our 11th grade, Mm -hmm. right? Do you think think that's a great move? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to say what is good or what is bad in this policy just because so much of it depends on how how this is going to play out, right? Like, how is the implementation going to happen? Um, But on on paper, I think it's a really good idea. I think for so long, we've been trapped in this humanity, science, commerce nonsense that's been going on. Like, science, like, humanity is bigger, hai. (laughs) <laughs> I, and I hope it sort of like I'm a humanities student and it was it was messed up, but um, but I, but I hope it, it it does it does break break some of that taboo around that yeah yeah and you know so just I think this is again something like Manan mentions is very common right so when we were in eleventh we used to 
at least if not talk to people from say ib schools we used to got to know about them right that or oh, they have taken physics with business studies and accountancy with fashion designing and this was something that even if we didn't understand it correctly it was something that all of us wanted to do so i think this is one one exciting aspect that you know we would want to look forward to but anyway moving moving ahead from schools so like the policy states that you know we are converting this into a three or a four year program and the four year program will help students take admission in foreign universities mm-hmm. however the question that still persists is that these foreign universities regardless of whether indian education in schools is three or four years uh, in sorry in colleges is three or four years for their admission is obviously going to be dependent on one's capacity to be able to pay the fee right which obviously comes down to everyone else's individual privilege so how is the cost of foreign universities and how is the fact that this these universities are still going to be afforded by only a select few people going to change or how is it going to help the economically lower categories in taking admission outside of this country and and i think in addition to that like a follow up question to that there if correct again correct me if i'm wrong but i think they're planning on inviting foreign universities okay. to india right so if they're inviting foreign universities to india what sort of incentives are they looking at to invite them to india and make sure that they get sufficient admission over there again as per jazz concerns not enough people would be able to like afford it so how are they planning on doing yeah, that yeah i mean just as a disclaimer higher ed is not my area of expertise so i'll try and answer it as well as i can um i think one of the scary things in the last couple of years has been how unaffordable higher education has been um starting to mm-hmm. get and the sort of uh, attack or dismantling of public institutes of higher education um and coupled with that like india is a huge mm. market like we have a ton of young people who want to get the best education that they possibly can and so from a from a purely capitalistic point of view from a market point of view it makes a lot of sense to invite uh, foreign universities to come to India and set up shop because we're an untapped market in in that sense right um and uh, so i think there's definitely one one source of inequity there um i think a, a more generous reading of the four year program would be that it includes now a research component within the bachelor's program itself so uh, that comes to why mm-hmm. the logic of dismantling the mphil and saying that look the four year undergraduate program is going to have a research component and so you can move on to a phd right after that and therefore creating like a larger cadre card, perhaps right. of, of phd educated uh, young indians that would be my generous reading of it but i think there's there's definitely mm-hmm. reason to be cynical yeah and you know like right. with all our podcasts we have run out of time and we are we are over time as always so you know without much more deliberation i think uh if i were to move towards a a, a concluding question that question for me would be in your opinion do you think that this is a step towards establishing equity in our community in a community which for as long as we can remember has been riddled by caste and economic barriers and do you think that this policy with proper implementation of course will help us narrow the gap that these disparities have perpetuated so i i think the question is what with proper implementation means right a lot mm-hmm. of what they're suggesting in the policy requires a lot of money to be spent in schools yeah. and higher education right and unless that money mm-hmm. goes where it's supposed to go this is not this is going to widen the gap rather than close them up uh there has to be an yeah. overhaul of teacher education teacher training but one couple of things just in the section on sort of the ways they've talked about um equity and inclusion i think one of the things that's been missed out is the fact that you can't it's difficult to club social economic disadvantage as one big group there are histories of exclusion and all each of these histories are mm-hmm. very different right the dalit history is different from adivasi yeah. history is different from a history of of uh, muslim minority groups right so unless we think yeah. about those histories in our policy it's going to be very hard to 
overcome or like to sort of not repeat history in those ways. And then one of the things that they've again done is this idea of special education zones where policies are going to be put in full effect. It's sort of the coupling of right. geography and inequity that doesn't always stand. It stands for some things, but I don't know how well that will that will go off. And I think lastly, we have to really think critically about policies outside of education. We talked about that in the context of vocational education, but also just generally the economy, the way we think about handloom workers, the way we think about migrant workers, the way we think about farmers. Right? Unless policies secure livelihood for people. This is not going to get us very much else. Very well, whatever. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think I think you've concluded it pretty brilliantly about how the implementation will take the burden of the whole policy because as we've seen with the other policies that have been implemented in this regime the implementation is not really the strong point of the current government right and and i think that that's another major aspect to it again like i read they say that the target of implementing this policy is 2040 right major contingencies with respect to that whether they'll still be in power for the next 20 years because as we know that there, there has been a cat and dog fight between whoever's been in the regime if one regime comes into power they remove the policies of the other so all this discussion might be futile in case there's a shift in the government there's a change in the government or even this, this would just turn out to be another complete shit show in case that there isn't proper implementation like you said so i think that's that's a note that that's a thought we can end on whether it will be a fruitful activity or not and again i would like to thank you for coming on and educating us about the education policy because honestly i was very very confused and very scared because there was sort of like conflicting arguments on either side so you you've cleared my head a lot and i and thank you so much for coming tanushree on our podcast yeah and i've just just one more thing that i like to add is manan's point of whether or not this government's going to stay in power is a podcast for another day that we'll definitely be covering but till then again like i just like to thank tanushree for taking the time out and joining us today and helping us figure out so much that again we would not have understood on our own and like with all our podcasts if you guys have any questions if you have anything that you feel that we've missed or that doesn't need to be here then please let us know So thank you Tanushree thank you guys for listening